Welcome back to the Marathon series in depth. In the last mission, we were able to activate some of the Marathon's defenses. We also learned that Durandal is rampant and that we should be worried about him. In this mission, we will be helping Leela prevent Durandal from taking over some of the ship's vital functions. Before we talk about this level, there is a small secret locker I missed pointing out on the previous mission, Never Burn Money. You can thank Hamish Sinclair for pointing this out on the Marathon story page. In the small corner room, near where you grab the circuits, there is a locker they can open with some ammo inside. It's not a big deal, but I don't want to miss sharing any of these juicy secrets with all of you. The current mission is named Couch Fishing. Couch Fishing is actually the name of one of the episodes in the show Beavis and Butthead. In the episode, Beavis and Butthead reel in various things with a fishing pole from their couch. They use all kinds of strange things as bait. It seems that Bungie was being a bit humorous with this title. The most likely reason for this title has to do with the Chris terminal in the mission that I will cover at the end of this video. It will make a lot more sense when we get there. This level was designed by Jason Jones, however he did not provide any comment on this one. We will be facing a new enemy in the mission called the Trooper. Here is what the Marathon Strategy Guide says about them. Troopers are cool. Nasty, but cool nonetheless. These bad boys sport assault rifles and are essentially gun-touting fighters with an attitude. Like other aliens in Marathon, they come in two colors, green and purple. Watch out for the purple ones. They're extremely aggressive and can fire both the assault rifle and grenade launcher in a relentless fury. Their Achilles heel is that they fire only when you're in their grenade range, about 15 meters. So use your pistol or fusion pistol to gun them down before they reach you. These guys are bad to the bone. Shake them down before they reach you. The troopers were mentioned in the last mission and defend this. The trooper is armored for vacuum conditions and carries a combination explosive and impact projectile weapon which is similar to your AR-75. So basically, the trooper is a 4 who has much better equipment as compared to the 4 fighters. They have a much deadlier weapon and also are wearing a suit that allows them to be vacuum enabled. In the first marathon game, there is only one vacuum level, and it in fact does not have any four fighters since they are not vacuum enabled. There are some issues where Bungie seemed to not hold true to this in the sequels, but we will discuss that when we get there. In general, the trooper's weapons are most deadly at short range, just like our assault rifle. This means that we really want to keep our distance from the troopers and take them out from as far as possible. Since we are playing on Total Carnage, we will not encounter green troopers and only encounter the purple troopers, which are much more aggressive and deadly. Just like the four fighters, the troopers will berserk at low health, and this can be a useful feature to take advantage of. Alright guys, so why wouldn't we start this next mission? Um, depending on where the enemies spawn, you could have enemies attacking you right away. So as soon as we start, we're gonna run to the end of the hallway. So there, yep, the enemies heard us. We're gonna grab our pistol. I guess I'll just run across here. There's this fit down there that saw me. Oh. Okay, there we go. We got rid of him. Um, in that group, you could just—you probably saw that trooper that was shooting us. So you can kind of tell. Here's some 5D space right here. Um, anyways, uh, we can go. That just goes down. That goes back where this fit was with the ammo. Okay, we'll go down there later because that kind of advances, and we want to get to a save station and heal first. So let's read this terminal. Public access terminal 903E. Security channel open. 
Defense Priority 120-F Incoming message from Leela. What's up with the security on this terminal? Perhaps the defenses on the marathon are still booting up, so Leela wanted to use a secure channel. Who really knows, so let's read on. I have some bad news. Durandal has gone rampant, and he is in the angry stage. This explains how Durandal was able to communicate with the four in this fit, while I have not. Theoretically, the Marathon Commuter Net is not big enough to sustain rampant growth for very long. This means that as Durandal grows into the computer net, he will begin to affect all aspects of the ship, resulting in unpredictable failures of otherwise benign computer systems. I have teleported here to make sure that Durandal cannot gain access to vital sections of the ship. There are a series of control switches which you will need to activate to block his access. Leela figured out that Durandal was rampant a bit after us it seems. This must have been what came to her attention in the terminal at the end of the last mission. It seems that because of Durandal's growth, he has become smart enough to be able to communicate with the four and this fit. Hopefully he hasn't said anything to them that we should be worried about. One thing interesting that Leela says is that Durandal would not be able to survive in a state rampancy for very long on the Marathon Net exclusively. The Marathon Net is apparently too small to support rampancy for very long. This means that Durandal could not have been rampant for too long. Who knows how long that is though. Leela tells us that there will be some unpredictable failures because of him. We will see what is likely his intervention on this very mission. Our mission on this level is to hit some switches that will somehow block Durandal's access to some of the Marathon's computer systems. The design notes say we need to take control of the area from Durandal and that it would be dangerous to leave Durandal in control of this critical section of the ship. What is the critical section of the ship that we are currently in anyways? Perhaps this being a critical section of the ship is why Leela had to go through security in order to get this message to us. The original level notes also say that Durandal is in the first state of rampancy, although next was crossed out. It seems that Bungie revised the state of rampancy that Durandal was in during design. This is where you are now. Study the map so that you can do this quickly. Here is the first of three switches that you will need to activate. Here is the second switch. Interestingly, this is the only switch that you really have to hit in order to trigger the end of the mission. I guess the other two are less important. This is the last switch. Be warned that the aliens have already entered this area. End of message. Okay, continuing on, so here this path kind of leads down here. Um, some ammo right here. I think there's a few enemies down here we should need to kill. Oh nope, here's the first switch. Sometimes the enemies kind of move around so. Around here there's kind of this path, this kind of just goes up and over the path and back down to the path. So this door and that door really don't go anywhere. Um, I guess it's another way, like if you get a bunch of enemies to get around them, I guess. Okay, so we gotta go up here, but there are a bunch of enemies here. Oh, get out of here. So we're gonna, we're gonna just lure them down. I am not sure how they got behind me. Maybe I got turned around or something. Oh well. I probably did. Oh shoot, they hit me. Let me get down. Okay, so there are quite a few. Uh, yeah! I didn't see him on the motion tracker. Let me move my mic a little bit. It's kind of getting a little droopy. Get a little too low. And tighten it up. Okay. Alright. Let's save this bad boy. Right on the other side of the save terminal is a shield recharge station. So the beginning part of the level is a little bit tricky. Um with the trooper and all these enemies and tight quarters and stuff because enemies can just kind of come around and fight you 
We want to go down there, but there's some enemies in there. Let's clear out down here first. Sometimes there's an enemy kind of down here. Okay. Nothing down there. There's a little secret ammo stash in here. Thanks to Total Carnage, we can pick it all up. And then we're going to read this terminal at the end of the mission. That's the Christ terminal number two. That switch opens a door farther on. Here's another switch we gotta hit that Leela told us to hit. Okay, and now we're ready to proceed. So this kind of area of the map is cleared out. Um, other than down here. Some enemies right here should be this is the third switch we're supposed to hit this is the only one you really have to hit we'll come back and hit that later though oh you know what I think these fours came out those were the two that or the couple that came from behind me I'm not sure it's kind of weird that they triggered there is a trooper in here so we're gonna use our machine gun there he is So I'm trying to hit him hard um, so that he can't hurt me. There are some fit up here that we have to worry about. We're gonna get him to come down. Come on, fit. They're kind of sticking up there. Should be two fit. Is there only one for some reason? Okay, let's have this elevator come down and go up there. Thankfully, there's another save terminal here. Okay, this one will. Like, if I go here, watch. I can kind of fall down here. So like once you get there, it kind of like is designed to close behind you so that you can't come back. But there is a way to get around this. So so I wait till it's kind of open most of the way and then I hit it again. And it should get stuck there. We can test it. You can see like it's slightly open. You can kind of test it because if you fall down and it doesn't close, that means we got it where we want it, right? So that's awesome because then we can get packed to the start of the level. Um, otherwise, we'd be stuck up ahead. So we can save it like that and then continue on. And now this is going to be a good battle right here. Ah, and there's a compiler shooting us down there. Ugh. Okay, this compiler is confusing me. Oh, he, he fell down at the beginning part. <laughs> I didn't know he would do that. Well, he's off at the beginning part of the level somewhere. Stay still. It's kind of hard because you can only aim down. Like, this is the farthest I can aim down. So I have to, like, move. 
You can kind of tell from the sound of the gun whether I hit him or not. Anyways, let's get this compiler done. Well, so much for that. I shouldn't have got cute with using my uh, assault rifle. Okay, I'm gonna just pound them with grenades here. It'd be easier than trying to kill them from afar. And then I'm just gonna bring them all in here. They're kind of fighting each other. Perfect. Okay. I can kind of jump down here, and there is some ammo in this corner nicely. I just gotta remember there is an enemy somewhere near the beginning, so let's save it real quick. Because we got the final room, which is a bit tough. You can see on the motion tracker when I ran back, the enemy that we skipped. So, okay, so here's some, some ammo we can get down here. Um, come around here, and this goes to the final room. So, you can kind of see this red on the map, um, where I'm standing, kind of like that L shape at the top of the map. So if we look behind us, once we get past that, it's going to lock us into this room. And there's a lot of, this is a big room, and there's a lot of enemies in here. So what I want to do is probably jump down there right away. Oh shoot, that did not work. I don't know why I decided to run right at the trooper. That was a bad idea. So let's try that again. That was pretty sloppy by me. Um, sometimes I get interested in... I kind of wanted to go at the trooper to get rid of him first, but I think that was a bad idea. I think we should be better off just getting down here first. And then just running around and letting them shoot each other. Okay. If we're if we're um, if we're a little bit smarter, we might be able to run around the top a little bit before we. Oh my gosh. Let's try this again. So I think if we're smart. Um, oh, I didn't get this ammo yet. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't save after getting this weapon. So as you can tell, this this part of the level is a little tricky. Um, I think if I run around the top a little bit first, oh well, and not run right into somebody, because because they kind they kind of pigeonhole you into fighting this battle. Um, I'm just gonna skip that weapon down there. I think I just gotta focus on. So I'm not great on health. So he's dead. So 
She's gonna jump down here now, I'm sure. Okay, got rid of him. Okay, so now we're good. Whew, that was a close one. It definitely worked a little bit better drawing back to the start, although we lost a lot of health from it. So we're so that opened up at some point while I was down there. So I don't know how far you have to go in order to get that open back up, but we can go ahead and uh, check the final terminal with without the with the unfinished message. Service area thirty nine public access terminal. Message from Leela. I've detected no change in the status of the control circuitry. You must return and make sure that all of the switches were activated. End the message. I guess we will have to go back and deal with the last circuit then, huh? Okay, and now we can run back and um, go hit that switch, recharge our shield, save it, all that jazz. So on Total Carnage, that part of the level is fairly tricky. As you can tell, it took me a few times. I didn't necessarily practice it a ton, but I practiced, practiced it a couple times. I don't know, I think it's more like authentic if I don't perfect it, right? Like I want to get a good strat. Oh, he's back, who knows where. I saw him on my um, radar, but he's just completely lost. So that, that switch I just hit is the only switch you really need to finish the level. And here I saved it, um, and now we're ready to go read it. So now um, when I start the next video, I can just, you know, Reload my save from there, then run to the next mission to start it, you know. So that way I'm basically at the same spot, just, you know. Some of these missions, later on, I won't be able to... The video editing will be a little bit tricky between levels, but... Alright, let's read this terminal. Service Area 39, Public Access Terminal. Message from Leela. Durandal has denied access to some of the critical computer systems. This should ensure the mobility and reliability of the defense drones. Unfortunately, I have received a distress signal from some crew who had sealed themselves off in one of the nearby access areas. They say that they have lost control over the doors and elevators on the level, and that the floor have access to this area. It appears that Thrandall has reacted to our move against him by giving the floor access to a formerly secure area. We will have to deal with Thrandall sooner or later but we can't be distracted from this for attack. I hope that his rampant behavior won't continually sabotage our defense efforts. I am sending you to go and save these crew. Clear the area of aliens. If enough of the crew survive, then perhaps we can get an intelligence report from them. End message. Jump pad activation. Initiation start. Transport when ready. It seems that this critical section of the ship must have something to do with the Marathon's defenses as blocking Durandal out has allowed more control of the defense drones. Durandal has given the four access to a secure area. We need to go there to help the crew members in the area that are in danger. Why would Durandal do this? Is he trying to distract us from being able to focus on blocking his growth? Either way, we need to address Durandal's little game and help save what we can of the Marathon's crew in the next mission. The original level design notes say that it is not clear whether Durandal opened the doors for the four right after he lost control or not. I guess Bungie decided to make it clear that Durandal opened these doors on purpose. The song for this mission is called Swirls. It is a gentler song that gives us a sense of mystery. Perhaps with the realization that Durandal is rampant, the security officer has a lot on his mind and he does not understand it at all. At the start of the mission, you can easily get surrounded if you are not careful. Before shooting your weapon, turn to the right and run down to the end of the hallway. You can safely start shooting there and have all the enemies line up in a straight line for you, which gives you easy pickings with assault rifle and grenades. If you are able to make one of the enemies berserk, you can also run back and forth through the air 
between two platforms. Jason Jones showed this off in a vidmaster film he showcased for the level. It's nice to see the level creator himself showing us some tricks. Unfortunately though, he didn't end up beating the level in this film. Another method you can use is to not shoot your gun at the start of the level as this will not wake the numerous enemies up. There is an interesting bit of 5D space at the same location at the end of the hall just east from the start. You will notice that the hallway exists on one side of the wall but couldn't possibly exist on the other. This is not the only instance of 5D space in the marathon games and we will see it happen quite a few more times. The close quarters at the start of the mission makes the first experience with the 4 trooper a deadly one. Interestingly, the original level design notes reveal that the level was originally going to have wasps instead of troopers. I guess Jason Jones decided that this mission was a good time to introduce the new unit to us. In part of the maze near the beginning of the mission, there was a secret cabinet door that lets you grab some additional ammo. There are a few napalm canisters in there that you are unable to pick up because the security officer apparently cannot reach far enough. While there are three switches that you are supposed to hit, you only really need to hit one of the switches to get the terminal success screen and proceed to the next level. The only switch of the three that you have to hit is the one closest to the switch to the northeast of the starting location on the other side of the wall. You need to go east directly from the start to reach it. The platform that you have to raise with a switch in order to proceed will shut behind you. This trap prevents you from returning to the start of the level and being able to save the game. This trap can unfortunately cause an issue with finishing the level because if you don't hit the switch required to beat the level, you will not be able to go back to fix your error. I wonder if Jason Jones realized this issue with being able to finish the mission. Luckily for us, there is a trick for being able to keep the door from closing behind you. If you hit the switch again when it is fully open, the door will get stuck in the open position and the closing of the door will not trigger. This makes things easier for me from a video editing perspective too. In the large room at the end of the level, there is a platform that will raise up to block your way, making you stuck in the final room and forcing you onward. Both of these platforms that blocked our way are likely a result of Durandal's intervention. The level design notes say that repair is easy, escape is difficult. It definitely seems that Bungie was trying to make the end of the level a challenge. This can be a problem, as there are a lot of enemies in the last room who want a piece of you. There is no pattern buffer at the end of the level, so normally you would have to play through part of the rows before you could save. Thankfully, because of my little trick using the platform switch, I was able to go back and save the game. Public Access Terminal 24F Unauthorized Access Alarm 2521 Security Breach 24-F Data Transfer Cohesion E3F04C Search String Christ The Christ Soul Orbiters I think this is the first terminal that has a security breach that does not have a compiler on it. I wonder why. Perhaps the compiler was previously on this terminal learning about the Christ and other important information about human history. Let's continue. The Christ Soul Orbiters, or cargo and resource in system transports, were huge ships shaped like the hollow potato and designed to be able to move huge amounts of materials between Earth and Mars with low cost and theoretically low maintenance. The system was simple. The Christ was put into orbit around Sol on the plane of the ecliptic. Built with a powerful solar sail, the Christ would change its orbit easily to pass by Earth or Mars. On a flyby, materials would be loaded or offloaded. The energy used to accelerate or deaccelerate the materials would be supplied by the solar sail. Loading was accomplished with a giant tether and reel system, which would swing the materials into orbit behind the crist and then reel it in slowly. Offloading was accomplished with a powerful ion beam, which would pound the offloading materials with a steady stream of ion particles. The description of how the crist works can be quite confusing. The Christ apparently orbits around Earth and Mars, taking resources and materials from one planet to another planet each time it passes. The transport would use its solar sail to adjust its orbit to maintain this path between the two planets. In the terminal, we learn that the tether and reel system was used to get the materials from the planet's surface into the planet's orbit. It's hard to know exactly what Bungie had in mind, but here are some concepts about how a space tether system could possibly work. 
Luckily for us, Arvid Sin and the Marathon community had some good ideas to help us understand a bit what Bungie might have had in mind. Interestingly, there are multiple concepts of space tethers out there on the web. A couple of popular concepts are the space elevator or a skyhook. I don't know if any of the space tether system concepts are actually feasible, but apparently in Marathon Universe, they found a way to make some kind of space tether work. The terminal tells us that once the materials were in orbit, the crisp would slowly reel them in. I guess they had some sort of hook or other method to grab the materials that are in orbit and would then reel them in. As far as to offload them from the crisp and get them onto the other two planets, the terminal describes a powerful ion beam that would pound the offloading materials with ion particles. Let me explain one possible way this could have worked. If the crisp was in its orbit around one of the planets and pushed the materials off into space, they would remain in orbit around that planet. If they were able to slow down the materials with an ion beam, and thus the materials would fall to the planet's surface gently with a parachute, the materials could have possibly also use the space tether system to help get to the planet's surface. If the space tether system was used, perhaps the ion beams would slow down the materials to the right velocity and trajectory to reach the tether system. Interestingly, there is a scientific paper on the space tethering system that was published on October 1st, 1994, which is just a couple months before the release of Marathon. The paper is titled, How an Earth Orbiting Tether Makes Possible an Affordable Earth-Moon Space Transportation System. Perhaps Bungie staff read this very paper, and it was an inspiration for the concept in this terminal. Interestingly, the crisp is said to be shaped like a hollow potato. This would be a good shape, as the center would be an empty space that would be filled with materials that are carried from one planet to another. Why doesn't Bungie just say an empty sphere? Why specifically a potato? Well remember, the mission is called couch fishing. If you are fishing on the couch like Beavis and Butthead, then you are probably a couch potato. Hmm, fishing from the couch or from the crisp. Reeling in those materials is kind of similar to fishing, ain't it? Budgie did have an interesting sense of humor back in the day, didn't they? Anyways, with this understanding of what a crisp is, I think most of the rest of the terminal will make a bit more sense. The design of the crisp was innovative and useful, but it was not low maintenance. Of the five crisps that were built, four lasted 100 years and the other only 73 before they returned to be brought back to Earth and refitted. Each refitting took about 15 years and completely occupied the Earth space shipbuilding facility for that time. The result was that no more then five Chris could be kept in service at a time. No Chris was ever built after 2310. The Chris failures devastated Mars. As the first five Chris were built, Mars colony grew quickly, confident that the growth would continue. But when the source of Mars resources failed, the colony found that it had overgrown its supportable size and extreme poverty stuck most of the population. Each time that a Chris broke down, the result was famine on Mars. The conversion of Deimos into the Marathon began when the Mars colony was at the height of its power. By the time it was completed 64 years later, the decline of Mars was well advanced. During that time, the Marathon's population had seen its standard of living dropped by 80%. On top of oppressive poverty, Martians saw one of their moons being converted into a colony ship in an expensive and risky colony adventure, which was predominantly funded by a ruling foreign power. The argument to make the marathon into a Christ became more and more popular, but the UESC never seriously considered this an option. The farther that Mars sank into the depths of poverty, the more that the marathon became a symbol of the oppression of the Martian people, the declining Martian world. After the marathon left Mars, the UESC's attention focused primarily on technological developments and the upkeep of the Christ. Mars was left to decay. Population continued to increase as attempts at mandating abortion or sterilization always started revolts. Spurious interrupt, breach disabled, further access denied, access denied, access denied, access denied. What happened to the people on Mars is quite sad. We know from the Marathon Manual that the security officer spent his childhood on Mars and his father died there when he was just seven. Perhaps the security officer joining the marathon was a way to escape the poor state of affairs there. 
We learned that the marathon was a symbol of how the UESC didn't spend the resources to care for the people who were on Mars, but instead spent their resources on their own purposes. It's a bit interesting that the security officer would choose to join the marathon despite this. In the manual, the security officer's father had asked him to never lose his honor. It seems that he likely did lose his honor in his choice to join the marathon in the eyes of the Martian people. The manual told us that no Chris was built at the year 2310. We know from the Lost Network packets that Dimos was purchased in 2395, and the marathon was launched in 2472. These dates tell us that the Martian people were living a life of poverty for over a century. This means that the security officer was likely born in a life of poverty. I'm probably going a little off track though and reading a little bit more into it than what is actually there. I think the purpose of the terminal though is to give us some more background into the past of the Marathon universe. Well that's all for this video. In the next video we will have to help some bobs that were put in harm by Durandal. That darn AI. See you all then.